Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. We are here for another poetry discussion. It is National Poetry Month here on the channel. In this video, we'll go into the National Poetry Month, um, or the poetry discussion playlist here on the channel, which is quickly approaching 170 total poems, but also it will be in the uh, New Hampshire playlist, pardon me, for Robert Frost here on the channel, if you are a Robert Frost fan. The poem we have in question today is titled The Pauper Witch of Grafton. Now, literature is all I talk about here on this channel, so if you find yourself here by chance but not design, consider hitting the subscribe button for more poetry, short stories, and novel read-alongs as well as a little bit of writing talk once in a while. And if you want to help me with what I'm doing here on this channel, hitting the like button tells YouTube to share this video with other poetry lovers, with other literature lovers, now, let's get into it. The Pauper Witch of Grafton. Now that they've got it settled whose I be, I'm going to tell them something they won't like. They've got it settled wrong, and I can prove it. Flattered I must be to have two towns fighting to make a present of me to each other. They don't dispose me, either one of them, to spare them any trouble. Double trouble's always the witch's motto anyway. I'll double theirs for both of them, you watch me. They'll find they've got the whole thing to do over. That is, if facts is what they want to go by. They said a lot, now don't they? By a record of Arthur Amy's having once been up for Hog Reeve in March meeting here in Warren. I could have told them any time this twelve month that Arthur Amy I was married to couldn't have been couldn't have been the one they say was up in Warren at March meeting for the reason he wasn't but fifteen at the time they say the Arthur Amy I was married to voted the only times he ever voted, which wasn't many in the town of Wentworth. One of the times was when twas in the warrant to see if the town wanted to take over the tote road to our clearing where we lived. I'll tell you who'd remember, Heman Lappish. Their Arthur Amy was a father of mine, so now they've dragged it through the law courts once. I guess they'd, they'd better drag it through again. Wentworth and Warren's both good towns to live in, only I happen to prefer to live in Wentworth from now on, and when all's said, right's right, and the temptation to do right when I can hurt someone by doing it has always been too much for me, it has. I know some folks that'd love that'd be set up at having their own town a noted witch. Having in their own town a noted witch, but most would have to think of the expense that even I would be. They, th they ought to know that as a witch I'd often milk a bat, and that'd be enough to last for days. It'd make my position stronger, think, if I was to consent to give some sign to make it surer that I was a witch. It want no sign, I suppose, when Malice Hughes said that I took him out in his old age, and rode all over everything on him until I'd bad him worn to skin and bones, and if I'd left him, if I'd left him bitched unblanketed in front of one town hall, I'd left him hitched in front of every one in Grafton County. Some cried shame on me not to blanket him, the poor old man. It would have been all night if someone hadn't said to gnaw the posts. He stood beside and leave his trademark on them so they could recognize them. Not a post that they could hear tell of was sacrificed. They made him keep on gnawing till he whined. Then that same smarty someone to look, he'd bet Hughes was a cribber and a bad nod, the crib and he, he slept in, and, as sure as you're born, they found he'd gnawed the four posts of his bed, all four of them to splinters. What did that prove? Not that he hadn't gnawed the hitching posts. He said he had, besides, because the horse gnaws in the stable ain't no proof to me. He don't gnaw trees and posts and fences, too. 
but everybody took it for a proof. It was a stra- I was a strapping girl of twenty then. The smarty someone who spoiled everything was Arthur Amy. You know who he was? That was the way he started courting me. He never said much after we were married, but I mistrusted he was none too proud of having interfered in the Hughes business. I guess he found he got more out of me by having me a witch, or something happened to turn him round. He got to saying things to undo what he'd done and make it right, like, no, she ain't come back from kiting yet. Last night was one of her nights out. She's kiting. She thinks when the wind makes a night of it, she might as well be herself. But he liked best to let on he was plagued to death with me. If anyone had seen me coming home over the ridge pole, stride of a broomstick, as often as he had in the tale of the night, he guessed they'd know what he had to put up with. Well, I showed Arthur Amy signs enough off from the house as far as we could keep, and from the barn smells can't wash out of plowed ground. With all the rain and snow of seven years, and I don't mean just skulls of Rogers Rangers and Musalock, but woman signs to man, only bewitched so I would last him longer. Up where the trees grow short and moss is tall, I made him gather me wet snowberries on, a slippery, ro- on slippery rocks, Beside a waterfall, I made him do it for me in the dark, and he liked everything I made him do. I hope if he is where he sees me now, he's so far off he can't see what I've become, what I've come to. You can come down from everything to nothing, all is if I'd a known when I was young, and full of it, that this would be the end. It doesn't seem as if I... I'd had the courage to make so free and kick up in folks' faces. I might have, but it doesn't seem as if. Okay, another long poem from Robert Frost. What happens here? What is the story going on in this poem? I think maybe it is sort of necessary first to put this out there. So, Robert Frost was born in 1874. The Salem Witch Trials were 1692. So, while the Salem Witch Trials are ancient history to us, they weren't quite ancient history for Robert Frost. So, while witches seem sort of Halloweenish sort of hokey to us, perhaps. In the world of Robert Frost, probably they would not have. Probably they would have had some more cultural weight. In fact, even through World War One, World War II, uh, with Aleister Crowley, there was a lot of talk of witchcraft and things like that having actual effect and some of so there was a lot on all sides of that war of sort of I, i'm not sure how to say it all sorts of paranormal paranoia i guess would be the right way to say things it was a much more paranormal accepting culture up through even world war 2 i think in large part it was the atom bomb that sort of um tamped down much of the paranormal talk in our in our society writ large anyway um because after all if we have that type of power why do we need a boogeyman but what happens in this poem our witch here has been declared a pauper and is wrangling about which county she lives in Then she gives us the story of her second husband having her unrecognized as a witch before she thinks, realizing she was more um, valuable to him if she was recognized as a witch. So then he did everything in his power to make other people think she was a witch. Um, And then she causes his death by making him pick berries on a slippery bunch of rocks and he um 
presumably falls to his death. What I want to ask here is, okay, the ambiguity is thrown up as to whether or not our speaker really is a witch. So the ambiguity is thrown up whether or not our speaker is actually a witch because of the fact that she is at some point unrecognized. Now, the insinuation is made by our speaker that this uh, husband of hers, she was mentally controlling him and making him go out on these slippery rocks to pick these berries, and that's how he fell to his death. That is the insinuation being made by our speaker. But I want to ask you, is that more likely than maybe this man who had his own will to be sure, as evidenced by the fact that he took his wife and then convinced everyone she was not a witch, and then said, ah, well, you know, maybe she is, right? So he has plots and plans of his own. Maybe these snowberries just looked delicious to him, and he fell to his own death on his own prerogative. Maybe that's the case, right? Is that, is it more likely that she tricked him into, controlled him, brainwashed him with her witchy powers into doing this? Or is it more likely that someone who is so susceptible to ideas as to be able to convince herself that she is a witch, is it more likely that that individual had something terrible happen to her that put her in the poorhouse, had her actually declared as a pauper, and is then able to convince herself that because something bad happened in her life, she must be to blame? Don't we all do that? Some misfortune strikes us, something bad happens to us, and we say, well, this must be my fault. We understand that on some level I must have caused this. There's two types of people, I guess. People who convince themselves that nothing in their, in their life is their own fault, and people who convince themselves that everything in their life is their own fault, regardless of how... Um, distant they may find themselves from these causes, how powerless they might be in their own situation and circumstance. Still, they must be to blame for the thing that has happened. That is sort of what I'm taking from this poem, is that our speaker here has convinced herself that because of this calamity in her life, she must really be a witch. She must really have done the nasty thing. And it's easy, isn't it? It's easy to have these, these maladies in our lives spring up and to convince ourselves that it is our fault, to convince ourselves we did the bad thing that brought this on. In fact, that's sort of where the idea of magic comes from. The idea of magic sort of goes all the way back to uh, much more primitive times when malady would strike the entire sort of civilization, our entire um, town, our entire group of individuals, our entire pack of people, and we don't know where the sickness comes from. So we say the sickness must come from some type of magic, some type of ill mana that fell from the heavens. And because we do this, because we are prolific at this. Uh, we are very good at pointing to cause where it is not. We had to be. We evolved to be that way. After all, it, when you are grazing the, the savannas of Africa... It is much easier to survive if you're a scaredy cat that every little noise behind another bush might be a lion. You're going to survive a lot longer than if you don't figure every little noise behind the bush is a lion. And it's that same part of our personhood that tells us 
everything can be blamed on something, whether it is a projection into the future or a diagnosis of the present. And even a recognition in the past. So if our speaker here has lost her second husband, inferring that she lost her first husband somehow, she's lost her second husband and is struggling for some way to find reason in it, it's better to find fault in yourself than no reason at all. After all, if I accept it on myself that I caused his death by being a witch and by putting these thoughts in there, I misdiagnosed this in the past. Maybe my third husband, if I stop being such a witch, won't come to this same type of fate. But if I accept that both my first and second husbands died by no fault of my own, and possibly by the pure randomness of existence, the pure randomness of the universe, the pure randomness that is inherent to life itself, if both of those men from my life disappeared in that fashion, there's nothing I can do to stop it. There is no control that I have over my own life. And if that is the case, isn't that a lot more scary? <clears throat> pardon me, than accepting, yeah, I'm an evil witch, but even an evil witch can turn things around. But if we are just victims of the way the universe unfolds around us, that's a lot more scary, isn't it? That is all I have for this discussion from Robert Frost the Pauper Witch of Grafton. If you like what I do here, it does me a whole lot of good if you decide to hit that like button. If you find yourself here by chance but not design, consider hitting the subscribe button because literature is the only thing I talk about on this channel. Short stories, poems, novel read-alongs, uh, sometimes writing stuff. That's all we do here. So consider sticking around for more of that, and I hope to have you back for the next one.